Hey everyone, welcome back to CityY Blackout, your home for music, movies, and more. I'm your host, Max Bowen. For this episode, I sat down with Michael Cook, whose career in the stage and screen was well underway, including a role in a new Netflix movie, when COVID-19 brought all this work to a screeching halt. He decided to use the free time to learn the skills needed to break into music. The result? His new album, Doing All Right, a powerful and uplifting collection of music. Michael and I dive deep into how his foray into becoming an Olympic athlete led to working on dozens of plays, films, and TV shows. We also look at the debut album, and Michael talks about the many messages people get from listening to his music. My next guest, well, between Hollywood, between music, he is certainly a busy, busy man. Michael Cook joins me. Michael, welcome to the show, man. It's great talking to you. There are like a million questions I have for you, dude. Man, it's great to be here. So to start things off, um, let's do a little bit of a background about you. So your earlier ambition was to actually join the Olympics. Just a, a small thing, you know, join the Olympics, no big deal, right? Like, you know, what happened that you that uh, that you had that as your goal? Tell you what, that feels like a million years ago. Really? It really does. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it really does. Um, I suppose, like, when I was really young, particularly in Scotland and the UK, I think it's the same in America as well, it's kids with any sort of, athlete, of athletic ability, you're sort of pushed in that sort of direction and... I guess I was sort of pushed in that direction as well. I think, in fact, my folks, they pushed me to to try so many different sports. Like, first of all, it was soccer. Then it was it was rugby. And then I was out running with my dad, and he, he says, do you fancy joining the, the local athletics club? I says, why not? And I, I went, and I found ourselves pretty good at it, so... Things sort of developed, and all of a sudden, I think everyone gets a sort of you get put on a pedestal almost. That's the sort of expression we use over here, and it's like, right, this is the aim, this is what you can go and do. And I think from the age of 13 up until about the age of 18, everything is geared towards going to the Olympics. Uh, in fact, I left school the last two the last two years that we've got of high school here. I'd left and went to a sports school. Now, there's an Olympic silver medalist. In fact, I finished second to Michael Phelps in the, the Olympics in 2012, Michael Jameson. He was uh, a year above me in school, so that was like the sort of level of guys that I was surrounded by. And You know what? I think you get to a crossroad in your life, whether you decide, look, is this going to be a way of life for me or am I going to be tempted by other routes? And I think... It just it just didn't quite work out with the with the with the athletics. So uh, at the age of about eighteen, I was sort of left with nothing to do. Didn't really know what to do with my life. So I left school and I didn't really have anything academically. So I tried a, a load of different jobs. I tried being a carer. That really wasn't for me. I, I worked in a, a takeaway shop. That never really worked for me. So I sort of I decided like, how can I stay connected to sports? But also, like, try and make a career, uh, like, have a living. And uh, I went to a sports college and decided that I was going to become a coach. I went down to the sports co- college, did my year, passed the course, and then I applied to go further. Because I had to start really far back, like, the lowest qualification, because I, I wasn't academic at all in school. I, I was, like, everything was obviously geared towards look, you're going to have this amazing athletics career, you're going to go and do this and go do that, and then when <laughs> that doesn't work out, you're sort of left in the dark. So I had to start the lowest sort of qualification you could. But I got on with it. I passed the course. I was waiting for my acceptance form for a sports science course. I got a letter in through my door, and it said, unfortunately, Mr Cook, you haven't been accepted onto the course this year. And I was like, what? Like, this is the summer. This is this is summer. And college is supposed to start in August. And I was like, nothing. I just completely lost. And I was sitting with my brother. Uh, my, I've got an identical twin brother. Um, and I was sitting with him. And 
I was like, look, what am I going to do in my life? I've like, I've been with nothing. I've like a fresh start, like totally lost. So I was trying to think, like, what do I like? What 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 could I possibly do? At the time, I used to collect movies. All the, like, I'd buy a new DVD when DVDs were a thing. I'd buy a brand new, I'd buy, I'd buy a, a DVD every week, every classic DVD you could imagine. Like I'd buy it every, I'd buy a new one every week, and I bought up a collection. I had, I think, I had about five or six hundred DVDs. And uh, I thought, why not become an actor? I didn't have any sort of drama background, nothing like that. And uh, and it's it's weird, like acting over here at that age, sort of 18, 19, it's like, it isn't thought of as this glamorous Hollywood, Brad Pitt, a sort of lifestyle, it's sort of, I don't know, it's sort of seen as quite feminine over here, if you if you were into doing creative things, so I was like, and it's totally like the opposite of the type of person, I'm quite introverted, and I just I thought, why not become an actor, and I looked up college courses, I found a college course, it was a higher national diploma, now that's the probably, I think it's like three levels, like a level below, if you pass in a higher national diploma, you can go on and get a degree if you wanted. I applied to the course, now you needed a couple of qualifications, which I didn't have at the time. I thought I'd chance my luck anyway, I'll apply. So I applied to the college course, went to the course, went to, got, first of all I got this uh, application form in, it had the application form where you had to write your general information, a little bit about yourself. But they also gave me this piece of paper that had writing on it, like, which I soon <laughs> discovered it was a monologue from a play called Blood Brothers. And I was like, what's this thing? And I was, I was reading it, and I was, I was reading over the application form, right? You'll be interviewed, we'll go through a few things, and then you have to audition. I'm like, audition? Like, then everything dodged, you actually need to stand up and you actually need to act if you want to become an actor. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew, right? You actually had to do some magic at some point. <laughs> but I thought I'd be able to handle it because I, I, I performed like athletics, like at national level, crowds of hundreds of people. I've like been in real, real tough, tough um, meets and really competitive, aggressive races. I'm like, right, I can handle this. I can. So I went to my interview, did the interview. Now, I had this sort of thing, I thought, you know what, see one-on-one -on -one with anyone, I can talk myself into anything. I can talk myself into anything. Then it came, can you stand up and do your audition? Do you know, I've never been as nervous in my life. I was physically shaking. I could feel myself shaking. My heart was going 200 miles an hour. I was just... So I go up and I struggle through this audition piece. Shake through it. I think it, I felt humiliated after doing it. I thought this must have been the worst thing I've ever done in my life. I go home and I decide to contact the the head of the college and I apologise for my audition. I says, look, I'm really sorry. I, I, I was really nervous. And, you know, if there's a course before this course, I would love to do it and progress and come in to do this if, if, if that's possible. She came back to me and she said, Michael, we loved your audition. We would love you to come and do the acting course. Now, you have hundreds of people who apply to this course, and there was only, I think there was only like 20, 20 spots on the course. It says, we'd love to give you an unconditional. So I got in without the qualifications and without uh, really any sort of background in it. So I was over the moon and with that. I thought, right, life's back on track. I'm going to Hollywood now. <laughs> well, you know, she... But, she must have like seen some potential because she she... Must, she must. I, I, I don't know what she saw, but that wasn't the, that wasn't the strangest part of it. The strangest part was a week later, I got a phone call off the sports college. They had sent me the wrong letter. They sent me the wrong letter, and they were asked, "This is look, you actually got an acceptance form for the sports science course. We'd love you to come and do this course." And I was like, "Look, man, I'm sorry. I've been accepted into this acting course. I'm going to Hollywood." <laughs> I love that that they had like two letters repaired for you, yes and no, and someone just like sent you the wrong letter. I think it, I think they send out see see rejection letters. I think they 
I think it's sort of a general letter, and I think yeah. it must be it must be like computerized where they go through it and it's automated and it gets sent out, and they obviously put me on the wrong list because I had a really like promising background in sport. Like I was, I was, I was pretty good at athletics, and I think I could have went on to coach quite well at it. And I think they saw that because when I went to the sports course, they did know who I was, did have a bit of a background in it, and that's fate. It must have just been fate. Yeah. And then, like, fast forward a little bit, you have a very impressive list of credentials, stuff um, for stage, television, movies. In fact, you're actually going to be in this new movie that actually, that actually just dropped on Netflix, The Princess Switch Switched Again. It's a sequel to another one. You have yeah. a role in that. Do you have a favorite role, like one that you say, this is, like, the one that I always talk about? Do you know, I've been really fortunate I would say screen on screen, doing high end productions is, is are great. They are limited in the type of role that you get at times. It's like I would say I'm still very early on in my career. Uh, I think when I signed with my agent, I was told, "Look, it's going to take you ten years to establish yourself." And I I, I do get it now. Being being on stage, being on productions, you do see it's almost like serving an apprenticeship over here like an internship that's like it, it really is a, I, I've learned more being on stage and being on film with other actors who are more experienced than me than I may than I did when I was at college there is one there was a, there was a play a theatre play that I did in Edinburgh in Scotland in fact it's a, it's a theatre that George Decay started in when he got he got a break he got a break in this theatre it was called the Netherbow Theatre a Scottish story a Scottish storytelling centre and it was a play called Darren Dora Star today I would say that was probably the most fulfilling role that I've ever played because it was like one of those really amazing roles with amazing emotional opportunities in it and it really did show you off the writing was so good that it showed you off really well as an actor so. That was fantastic. I, I did a play out in Italy. I had a, an internship at the Piccolo Theatre in Milan where I, play, I played a Fiddies in a Shakespeare play called Coriolanus. That, there's actually a film on Netflix called Coriolanus that's got Ray Fiennes and Gerard Butler in it. Uh, I played, I had a really good role in that. That was an excellent experience. Um, now You See Me Too, that was a fantastic experience as well. That was actually probably my first opportunity on a set that was that of that size. It was uh, that was that was a really incredible experience. But man, it's just a, it's such as I think you're, you get so focused on the work when you're doing it, or you get so focused on doing a good job that uh, George, you've got to remind yourself to enjoy it. Like doing the doing like the princess switch. I think I think I had a couple had a couple of lines in the film. Do you know what I mean? And I remember one of the crew who were staying in the same hotel as me turned around and says we could hear you practicing your line for about four hours like it's only a couple of lines I'm like man I know but I'm like this is my shot I need to I, 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 need, to, I need to get it right I need to get it right and it's, it's just it's just part of it I think oh yeah I, I I definitely agree I mean like even if it's just a couple lines it's still your role and you gotta own that thing you gotta do a great job because you wanna keep getting more offers and if you just kind of you know, uh, breeze through it. I think it, it tends to show. No man, you're you're 100 right. You really are. It's like my friend. He was an extra, and it and that, that that brought some. Do you know? I think that made me like sort of bring me a more to it because I'm like I was in that like it was a pretty big scene. All the main cast are there. We're doing this scene and I'm playing um, the royal page and I've got to go out and I've got to announce the queen and do all that stuff. And I went out to like and did this big scene in front of like 250 extras. That's strange. You sort of just poke fun at each other most of the time. But my friend just got to me, man, I was impressed watching you actually at your work. It's like you really brought it. It's like you held everybody in the palm of your hand when you did it. And I said, thanks, man. <laughs> That means a lot. That's it, like, right there. Ever, ever had the chance to meet 
any like actors or actresses that you are just a huge fan of? I've been on sets with huge actors that obviously I'd have loved to have met Morgan Freeman, but I think we were just sort of sh- like passing shadows. He was coming off of set and I was coming on set and I sort of just been around that presence with the house and around that sort of presence was, that's incredible. Uh, but do you know, my brother, my brother's an actor as well, my, tw- my twin. And we were speaking about this before. It was like, you're going on to like a huge movie set and you ask yourself, like, oh, such and such is in this. And you go, play it, play it, play it cool. And you, you sort of remember, look, there was a first time that these guys were on their sort of first big set. But I think, see, ultimately, see, like, when you want to be taken seriously as an actor, and, and especially the fact that you're going in here and you realise, look, I want to do this as a, I want to do this as a career. This is my career as well. You, I think you go in with a sort of more sort of focused mindset that look we're equals in a sense that we're both here to do a job and i think you've got to have respect for yourself in that way and have respect for others when you're when you're on a set like i'm not there to get to get autographs you know see when i just started out i'm talking about in fact i was still at college so i'd never been on a movie set before and i decided to go and be an extra in a tv show and I met an actor there that I knew, like I'd seen on TV and that, and I, I used to like him. I'm not going to say who it was, but <laughs> I'm not going to say who it was, but I was, I was a fan of this guy. Being on set with him and seeing him in person and how he actually behaved, do you know, it was such a letdown. I was, it was such a letdown because I'm like, man, you just don't meet the expectations of the person like I thought you were. And I remember I was in an elevator with him and I thought, you know what, this is my chance. And this is the only time that I've ever done this with anyone. And I think it sort of ruined it for me. Uh, I says, hey, can I get a photograph with you? So, and he says, yeah, no bother. I get a photograph with him. I left and I thought, what am I doing? Why did I get a photo with him? I didn't even like him. And I deleted the photo, and I deleted the photo right away. And you know, see, since then, I've never asked anyone for their autograph. And you know, I would never want to meet any of my heroes. I wouldn't. I think I just I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to meet any of my heroes. I think it's uh, the mystery's sort of safer. It's a bit better. <laughs> I get you. I get you. Because like, because like, you don't want to shatter the illusion that you have of them. Like, you see this as his grand presence, and then you meet them, and you think, wow, you're really shit. And that just kills it all for you. Although, and I've had, I, de- I, think, I definitely think uh, I've had the best results from performing when I made a, I sort of made a decision with myself, like a pack, like, look, go in. See, when you're on an acting set, an awful lot of the time, you find that a lot of the supporting actors will swing towards the, the main actors or to try and be part of the group or trying to do that. And I'm not saying. Be ignorant and ignore everyone. What I'm saying is, have a wee bit of self-respect. Remember, first of all, you're there to do a job. I decided, right, go in, do my thing, do what I'm, do what I'm there to do. Focus on what I've got to do. Don't get caught up in the pettiness and uh, the desperation to try and meet new friends and try and uh, do that sort of stuff. And to be honest, I, I think it's, I think it's made me a better performer because it sort of makes me. Uh, Keeps it keep it sort of keeps me focused and keep it make I remi- it reminds me of why I'm there and what I'm there to do. Mm. So I mean, first and foremost, you're there to perform, and that's what they're paying you for. I like that approach, like because you're not there to get stuff for Instagram, you're not there to get autographs, you're there to do a job. It's like this is what they're paying me for. I'm gonna show up, I'm gonna do the work, and that's it. Um, yeah. But speaking of like you know you know like heroes and so forth um are is there someone that you would absolutely love love to work with like you're like actor or actress bucket list you almost get I'm not intimidated by it but you know i'd love the challenge see guys like casey affleck ryan goslin like drive is like probably one of my favorite films of all time uh, these are the guys that i saw i've watched their performance and they're so they're so subtle and so impactful at the same time that, you know, 
I look at them and I go like that's that's the aim that's that's where I want to be that's what I want to do is being those types of films it's like do you know what it is it gets me see scenes in films like have you ever seen Manchester by the Sea now there's a scene in this this guy like I don't want to ruin the film for anybody but this guy goes through this really horrible experience the worst experience imaginable for a guy in a relationship and he bumps in with it, he had a wife and stuff and then split up because this horrible thing happened and they meet under the they meet after not speaking for years and they they try and talk to each other i swear honestly it's like you can barely watch the scene it was that it was it was so intense like and it got me i'm like man that's what i want to do ryan gosling and drive just a look he gave the 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 actress when he was in the lift before he realized like look you don't change and turns back to his old life it's like conveying a whole story and a whole character and a look it's like that's that's got to be there now given that you don't have this like lengthy acting background you got into this a little like later in life do you ever deal with doubt when you get on set do you think man these guys have like 40s experience i'm just some guy who you know just happened to nail his his audition but who was i before that man do you know I've been thinking about that quite a lot, actually. And I think there's a thing I was reading, it was about, I think it's Sam Fender. He's a British sort of, he's a British rock star. And he was talking about this thing, this imposter sort of uh, feeling that a lot of folk get when you just sort of break into something. And I definitely, I have definitely dealt with that. Like, I think self-doubt, is always going to be there for most folk, and I think if a lot, if, I think if someone says they've never thought, had self doubt, or never questioned themselves, man, I, I struggle to believe them. I struggle to believe if they're telling the truth or not, because like I think the biggest battle you've got is with yourself, and, and I think it's always going to be with yourself because I've been there, I've been on stage, I'm like, how do I do that? How how watching someone like. Can I do that? And then you go away, you do a show, you look in a paper and you realise there's a review there that someone's actually watched you and took the time to turn around and say, like, you were great. It could go the other way where they, where they give you a negative review. I've just been, I think I've been quite lucky that I've had quite positive reviews for stuff that I've done. But, do you know, I remember getting asked, how do you cry on stage? How do you cry when an audience is watching you? And do you know, the, 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 I don't know. I just know I can do it, and I don't question it. Don't overthink it. Just look. I was on stage once, and I told my brother, says like he he came and watched the play, and he says, "Look, man, you nailed that." I don't think I could do that. I don't know if I could. Do you know? I look at it two ways. Either I'm going to connect with the scene, and I'm going to cry if it if it requires that, or I'm going to choke in front of. 600 people and that's going to make me cry anyway so either way i'm crying on stage so <laughs> i like that approach i dig that one now have you and your brother ever had a chance to act together in something we have we've, we've acted in a theater play together not as twins he it was a play that was split into two halves the first half was world war one it was based it was a war it was a war play it was about the play sort of it's based around the night before these soldiers are deployed into what into into the war. The first half of the play was World War One. The second half of the play was World War Two. He played my dad in World War One in the first half of the play, and I was his son in the second half of the play. So it saved any quick costume changes. Wow. Me. <laughs> meanwhile, like your actual dad's like, huh? Is that what I sound like? Okay. <laughs> But no, we did. We, yeah, we did that. We did that together. That's so we we're actually, we we're actually both in um, now. You see me too, as well. We, we weren't playing twins. We we're playing the same person, and it was the whole thing to do with like now. You see me too. It's about these magicians, and they do these tricks, and they rob banks, and they do that sort of stuff. And my brother and I were hired to help um, Dave Franco get away from the FBI. So. And the whole trick sort of based around you don't know it's twins. How did this guy get there? And how did this happen? It was that was a lot of fun. And the good thing about it was it was such a big set to be on. It was the, it was a first time on a huge sort of like a Hollywood movie set. And I think it was sort of a comfort actually having my brother there with me. And I think it was probably the same for him. Like 
It was a, it was a really great experience. So but we've actually we, we do actually try and not do things together. Like we don't want to get a sort of typecast as twins. We've got different agents in that now, so we sort of try and do our own thing as much as possible. When it comes to finding like new projects to work with, how do you go about doing that? And as a follow-up question, how do you know when a project is right for you? In fact, my brother and I were arguing about that tonight because I got I, I got an audition for something that maybe I didn't suit as well, but I think a whole lot of this, it's, 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 there's an awful lot of compromise in it. I think, look, man, I don't have an ego. I've got projects that are more desirable than other projects, but see, to be honest, this is a really, really hard profession to get into, and it's really, really tough. Seems to I'm in a position where I can pick and choose the projects that I want to do. Within reason, I'm going to do what I can. If you start reading the project and you're getting excited while you're reading the project, it's like, like I've had that a few times, and luckily enough, I got the part that like I was going for. So I think when you get an immediate connection with it, like, see, if you're, you're reading a script now, you get told when I was going for acting classes, you're told, but like, try and read the first draft when you're reading a when you're reading a script. First time you read it, try and just read it dry, like don't get carried away. But see if you're reading something and you're starting to do accents and you're starting to like get ideas for something right away, then you, you can feel it. You know it's right. You know it's right. And if you can really hear yourself doing that part, then I think. Those are the ones, those are the ones. But, you know, see, at times, good writing is hard to come up, come by. Do you think there's a particular genre that is your strength? Well, do you know, I think I'm, I'm quite subtle when it comes to when, when it comes to acting. Even on stage, I remember I was doing a play and one of the lead, the lead, the lead actresses in it, and it says, and you, you're so still on stage. How do you stay so still? Like, a lot of theatre actors feel the need to sort of wave their hands about or you've got to speak with your whole body. And I always thought, like, I said to myself, like, really early on, it was like, right, see if you don't know what to do with your hands, do nothing. Just don't do anything. Just don't do anything. There's no need to it because it just it comes across as overacting. And to be honest, I've always wanted to be, always wanted to be a movie actor. Like, I love theatre. I do love theatre. There's nothing better than um, being on stage. But film acting, it's like it's, you're given a different opportunity. It isn't just it isn't just cut. It doesn't it doesn't just come and go. You have takes and takes and takes to get something right and to explore different ways of doing something. That's that's what I love about um, movies. So always just went for like, stay still, go for something. So do you know, see guys like Robert Redford and Paul Newman and like these sort of guys. It's like those are the types of films that I, that I love. I love great writing. I love great writing that speaks for itself. It's like almost like I want it. <laughs> I want it to be made easy for the actor. Now, of course, the pandemic has brought so many things to a halt. The film industry is definitely one of them. I'm curious: did this sideline a lot of things? Did this force you to kind of put some things on the back burner? <laughs> it's weird for me. It was actually an opportunity because I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now about. Uh, like, obviously, we'll speak about the album um, later on, but I wouldn't be talking to you about. Um, my album coming out probably if it wasn't for the pandemic because I remember when I when I got into music the main thing that I was told is look and this is and it's something that I found really fascinating was in acting you're given opportunities you've only got a certain amount of creative control over the opportunity because first of all someone's paying you to be there the director's the boss and he'll tell you how to do something and how he wants it whether you like it or not, really, until you're in a position where you can turn around and say, well, where you can have a wee bit of more uh, creative control, but ultimately, you're limited. So the beauty of music is you've got complete control over the music. You've got complete control. Like, literally, if you write the songs, you sing the songs, you go to a studio, you get a producer, and it's like you're, 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 you're in the driving seat, so... Although the acting door shut this year, because the industry pretty much just fell flat in its face, it's just nothing was getting made, nothing at all. Like I think I got my, I think I've had two auditions this year so far, because it's just been just there's just been nothing. Like, and the problem is is that you've got when roles are coming up, 
they're looking for actors in that specific area. It's a lot easier when you can travel for roles and you can travel for things like things are really, really limited. So I decided to focus my energy on the music this year and sort of push towards it and, and focus more on, right, finish this album, get this album out, promote this album. And when the acting door opens up again, then you push that. I've got an agent. Uh, she's great in London and she, she'll constantly be pushing stuff for, uh, for me. But I'll be honest, at the moment, I hadn't been as productive as I was um, at the start of the year. And it was purely because I knew the opportunities weren't there at the moment. Do you know what I mean? It's like you could write to every casting director in the country and it's like, look, there's nothing here for you. I spoke to my agent about it and you've just got to take it on the chin. There's no point in trying to wish it a different way. You've got to just take control of what you've got control over. Mm-hmm. Then let's talk about the album, Doing All Right, just dropped a little while ago. Uh, this was amazing. I, I absolutely loved, loved the album. Um, Thanks, sir. When it came to going into music, though, did you have to do a lot of learning to kind of get yourself up to speed? An awful lot of learning. Um, the reason I got into music was because I, I remember when I started out in my acting career, I got signed off a good agent in Edinburgh. It was probably it was one of the better like the better agents in Scotland, and I remember additions could be few and far between when you're with a slightly smaller agency. So I wrote to a casting director that I knew and asked for a bit of advice. I says, look, this industry is really, really difficult, especially for a young actor. And you get an awful lot of pay- The rejections, first of all, is hard to deal with. Secondly, auditions can be few and far between at times. Like you can go two months without even getting an audition. And I says, how do you, like, how do you keep your sort of, like, keep sane almost? Like, how do you keep, like, sort of mentally focused and sort of mentally in line? And she said, stay creative. Whether it's writing, whether it's music, whether it's even working in a theatre, stay in touch with it. Because what I didn't realise is, like, when you go to audition, and if you're not being auditioned consistently, you're cold when you go to the audition. And by the time you finish that audition, you're like, right now I'm warmed up, I want to do this audition. And you're ready for the audition, but then go for another month without getting an audition. So it's like you've always got to stay. You've got to stay sharp. You've got to stay focused. You've got to you've got to stay ready to like for when the for when the sort of opportunity comes. So I, I, at the time, I I thought, well, I love music. I do. I've always loved music. I grew up a family who loved great music, like sixties, say seventies, eighties, sort of really, really. Eclectic, different styles of music and that, and that I grew up listening to like, like so Bob Dylan, Neil Young, um, the band, that sort of folk scene. Then there was the rock scene. You've got ACDC, Bruce Springsteen. You've got you've got all that sort of stuff. And I thought, well, I'll start learning the guitar. That'll keep me creative. Learning an instrument. Plus, it, it also helps you with your acting career as well because, like, first of all roles for where for actors that can play instruments like that it's a skill so i learned the guitar and thought you know i'm gonna try and sing a song I try to sing a song and oh i think a cat sounds better it really did it sounded an awful lot better because i didn't have any concept of key i had no concept of key so when i went on and got a uh, chords for a song Guy who sort of changed my life, Marty Schwartz, was the guy that I learned how to play guitar off of on YouTube. He taught me how to play chords, he taught me how to play, and it was all four chord songs. It was really, really, it was an amazing, it was a really excellent t shirt, taught his strumming patterns and stuff. But I tried to sing the song and I couldn't sing it. I thought, man, I can't do covers. I just didn't have any concept of, wait a minute, you get this thing that's called a capo. And you can move it up and down the fretboard and you can change the key that you're singing in. But I remember I was just sitting and I thought, for a laugh, like just for fun, I just thought, I'll try and write a song. And I wrote this wee sort of blues song. I went, I thought, that that sounds all right. I'm singing that a wee bit better. And I went into my dad, because he's brutally honest with me. Like, he tells me everything. Like, you should have heard his reaction when I told him I was going to do acting. Like, couldn't believe it. Now he's the most supportive guy ever. 
but he uh, played this song for him and I could just see his face after I'd done it and he's like that was excellent that was really really good I thought I think I'm going to start writing songs I think I'm going to become a musician as well Um, but I love music it's like people ask you an awful lot of times like about music and about writing songs and about doing that sort of thing, but see to be creative. I found I sort of discovered like see being creative, whether it's an actor or a musician, it's a way of life that like it isn't a pastime. It's that like, you've got to sort of live and breathe it like every day. And my brother, he would play the guitar, but he'd go away and he'd play it for say thirty minutes one night. And he thought, right, that's me practicing. I says, man, I didn't practice. I played. That's what it was. That like, I could sit and play for three or four hours, and time flies and just like you sort of live and breathe it and it's just ah uh, yeah man it was like getting the sort of the musical journey and I found that I sort of had an ear for sort of I think see listen to guys like the Beatles I always remember getting told it needs to be melodic the music needs to be melodic that, that, that is just like that is the key ingredient it's like if you've got a bad song you can make a bad song good if it's melodic, you can. At least if it's melodic, you've got something to work off of. I sort of took that approach with it. And then it's just like your arms and legs, man. And it's just... I love that you basically got into music because, like, acting was, you know, temporarily put on hold. It's like, okay, I'm going to do music now. I'm going to just, you know, jump into the, into this thing. And a year later, you've got an, a new album. Not even a year, actually. Maybe, like, six or, like, seven months later. New album's out there. It sounds awesome. When it came to singing, though, I think your singing voice is phenomenal. Like, how'd you learn? I think, again, it comes down to key, the key that you sing in. And I found that I, I, there was a range, like, my voice, can, I can sing here. And, you know, it's when you're writing the song, it's just where the song, it's just, it's just the way that it comes out, I think. And I think being an actor, right, being an actor, you sort of need to, you need to manipulate your voice into, like, whether you're change, if you're changing your accent, if you if you've got to do an American accent, or you've got to do an Irish accent or an English accent or whatever the accent it is you need to do, you need to manipulate your voice to suit the dialect. And most importantly, it needs to sound as though it's coming from your mouth when someone is looking at you. It can't be put on. And I find that the songs on that album, like I goes, man, your voice sounds different there from what it does there. In that song, and I'm like, I know, I, I don't, I, I can't explain it. It's just um, when I sort of write the song, say I'm playing in the key of E, see if it comes out, it just sounds right. Sometimes it just comes out right, and it, it sounds in key, and it's like right. Other times it doesn't. I go right, you know, it sounds a wee bit low for me, and my voice is struggling to get it. I'll move it up a little bit, and it's a lot of it's just trial and error. To be honest, it really is. It's just trial and error. It's, I think a lot of folks think you wake up one day and you just do this thing and it's like it sounds amazing, it's the end product. But I'll tell you what, it's a really hard journey when you're getting there. It's like it is really, really it's a tough, tough road. An awful lot of failures and an awful lot of things not going right. And then eventually, if you're lucky enough that it comes out right, then go with it. Exactly. How did it feel when the album was out there? When you finally put it out there? And it was a bit of a relief, uh, almost. You sit in this thing and you, you're like, you can build it up in your head how this thing's going to go out. And to be honest, I, 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 I didn't really like listening to myself. It's the same with the acting. Like, I don't really like watching myself either. I think I'm sort of, I'm sort of one for the creative process. And it's like, you put it out there, it's almost like you're letting it go. You're letting it go. And it's, and, You've got to do a bit of marketing in that after that. That's the stuff that I find a wee bit hard. But I understand now how necessary it is. It's like it's so necessary marketing and pushing it out there. And then I actually, I actually listened to the album from start to finish. I was out running and I listened to it and I thought, man, you did a good job there. Like, uh, that, that was a good job. Like, I think there's at least there's going to be at least one song in that album that someone's going to like. There's got to be, and I felt a wee bit. I felt a wee bit nostalgic, like 
that that was good. I loved that process. I really did. I loved that process, and a uh, and I think the best way to grow creatively for me is to let something go and then sort of move on. Like I've already started recording my second album. I've already started doing that because I think it's it's about moving on and trying not to create. I'm never going. I'm not going to be able to create that album again. I won't be able to create that create that album again, but. I believe that I'll create a different album and create something new, something fresh, and not try and sort of like. There's a song on that album over here that pe- that people love, and it's called "Losing My Mind for Nothing." It's a really commercial song. I find it's like it's, I think it's a really radio friendly song to be honest, and I think it's a sing along song. But I'm not going to be able to recreate that song. I'm not going to be. Able, I find the thing that disappoints me the most with the, with the artists, and it's remember I went to see a guy Jack Savaree. And I mean, the guy can sing the phone book. He's an amazing singer, amazing singer. And his first album was amazing. And I remember I went and seen him live, and it was stuff from his second album he was playing. I was like, man, that's so disappointing. It's like you've wrote the same. You've, what you've done, you've just got the same songs, and you've you've just wrote them a different way. Like there's nothing fresh and nothing new about it. Whereas likes of Dylan and likes of Neil Young, it's you can you can add, and David David Bowie, like it's the. Uh, you can actually see, and it isn't about being different for the sake of being different. I think it's more so about growth and change, and it's where you're at because you can't, you can't, you can't recreate something. You can't recreate like something. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and I like that you're already working on the new album. I've never known an artist to release an album and say, "I'm just going to stop and take a nice long break and sort of bask in the glory of." me and release my, my music they're always like nope it's done on to like the new thing when you talk about going in some like new directions do you have anything in mind right now do you think you have some ideas to what new things you want to try out well do you know i'm constantly writing songs constantly write songs and what i find is the song sort of dictates what you're going to do the song really does dictate what you're going to do because i find then it's it's different types of songs that i'm that i'm playing and it's I find that I've got I've got better at the guitar because I'm playing so much, like different styles, and uh, I find that sort of dictating the direction you're going in. It's like, is it going to be like a million miles different? Like, but there is definitely you can, you can see a sort of growth there. So you, you can see a sort of progression, and I just man, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm the same as everybody else. It's like I don't know. It's like you ever go in and you go to do something that's you have the, I think people have this idea that when you watch someone and say someone's doing something that you think, wow, he's doing that thing and that thing's so great. He must be really, really sure of what he's doing and he must know so much. I think you're just as clueless. I think I'm just as clueless as everyone else. Like, I'm, there is a certain degree of winging it and sort of going, sort of going down the rabbit hole and seeing how far you get. Speaking of which, looking ahead, you know, eventually things will, you know, this whole part of life will come to a close. Movies will come back. Shows will come back. What do you see? Your, what direction do you see your your career taking? Do you think you'll be able to balance up both these things? Do you think one might sort of take precedence? I don't know. I really don't. The way I sort of I've always approached it, see whatever allows me to be creative, whatever sort of field allows me to be creative, that's 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 where I'm going to be. It's. If I'm getting a lot of acting opportunities, I'm going to be doing that. But I tell you what, whenever I've went and done an acting job, I've always took a guitar with me. I've always took a guitar with me. So it's like I was out in Italy working and I says to the director, look, can you get me a guitar? He says, yeah, I know the sound engineer. He's, he's got a guitar. I'll get you a guitar. And I just, I've always got a guitar with me. So. Like I said, it's a way of life. I don't look at it like a career. It's what I want to do all the time. It is, if that's what we're talking about, if it's a career. But it's like, I don't look at it like, right, this is what I do for work. Because I, I sort of thought when I was younger, it was, I never wanted to do something where I work five days days of the week and then I'll, uh, I'm off two. I live two days of every week. No, man, I want to live every day. So I want to do something that really fulfills me and gives me meaning. So I always, I, I just like, whatever allows me to be creative, I'm always going to do it. One of the things that I really dug about the um, about the album is 
it sounds really uplifting. And I think, of course, right now we need that. We need u- uplifting as much as possible. Would you say there's an overall message in doing all right? Do you know, I've always wrote subconsciously. It's like I've, I've, I've wrote a song and I sit back and it's I listen to the song and I'm like, I ask myself, where did that come from? So I, I, I've never, I've never really sat there and thought and wrote intentionally. Right, this is what this subject matter needs to be. I've had other people telling me, "Oh, that song means this, and that song means that." And I'm like, "Do you know what? See if that's what that means to you. Then great, because obviously it meant something to me when I was writing it. I had to. Have, I found that it isn't a coincidence. See, you write." I do think the best songs that you write, sort of all the bulk of it, 80%, 80% of the song comes in like five minutes. It's like you get it all and it's just like this sort of creative surge that comes through you and you thought, how did I come up with that? How did that write? So that's there. Now I need to sort of fix that, whether it's a verse that I need to put in or a bridge that needs to come into this. But 90% or 80% of this thing is there. I think it can't be a coincidence that... If you write lyrics like weeks apart from each other and you think, wait a minute, they two lyrics match up. I think it's sort of got to be the headspace that you're in at that specific time that sort of sort of makes the song. But I don't know, somebody says to me, it's like a pal of mine's a director friend of mine, it's like I've, we've got I've got a couple of music videos up on YouTube and stuff for a few of the songs. I'll send them over to you when they later on. He was describing one of the songs to one of the actresses, and he says, right, this is a really upbeat melody with a really sad song underneath it. So we're going to play on that, and I'm like, wait a minute, I didn't realise that that was a sad song. Like, if you listen to the lyrics of the song, that's a sad song disguised and comforted with with this really upbeat, positive sort of melody. So <laughs> I think it's a... There's a load of different things going on in the album. A, a load of like, I don't think it's just. I don't think it's one theme, because I think some of the songs are sort of telling different stories as well. There is one thing I sort of do intentionally in songs at times, is I go right. I've got the guts of a really good song here. Now I need a hook. So at times I will intentionally try and go right. Or the hook's already in the song. How do I heighten that in the song? It's like the song In A Dream. I started playing that and I think I'd only ha- I had two verses down. But right away, I knew the bit, there's nothing I want from you, there's nothing I need. At the end, I thought, right, that's the hook. Right, now intentionally we need to fit this in throughout this song so that that sort of, sort of stands out. And that's the thing that sort of catches, like it will, it will catch people when... You play it when when the song's being played and when they hear the song. So I'd say that I'd say that part of it is, is, was quite was was quite intentional. One thing I was really curious about: Do you find that there's any correlation between acting and music? Do you find those two worlds really cross at all? A hundred percent. I think yeah. I think that I think they're totally intertwined with uh, with each other. Although there is very there's one very very specific difference that. It's weird and it's sort of a critical difference because I didn't notice it until I performed live as a musician. You're totally vulnerable when you're a musician because you've got to be yourself, whereas when you're an actor, you're a complete fraud. So, so that that is a slight difference when it comes to when it comes to acting and uh, music. But being creative, I think it's uh, it's, 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 same, it's the same as a painter, it's the same as a dancer. It's expression. So. Well, most, some acting stuff's expression, some some of it, some isn't so much. Like, but ultimately, it is. Plus, when it comes to acting, all they're seeing is the finished product. They are not seeing all the takes it took to get there. With music, that's be- when you perform, one shot. That's it. And you know, it's so easy now. Like with music, for uh, do you know what I've been watching? Uh, I, I don't watch an awful lot of TV. I don't, or, and I don't. I will never watch TV at night, like say ten o'clock at night before I go to my bed. I'll I'll maybe put on a film or I'll uh, watch a documentary or something. I've been watching a lot of music documentaries, and I was watching Tom Petty's. Love Tom Petty. Yeah, that guy had 
sort of, the, he had the ear for rhythm and he had the ear for melody and great songwriting as well. Fantastic artist. And what they were talking about was when you used to record with tape compared to recording digitally now, that's why you've got so much shit out there now. It's so much absolute garbage out in the music world now. And it's because what you can do is you can manipulate someone's voice, first of all, like auto-tune. And even worse, it's like you get stuff that's auto-tune, but it doesn't sound like auto-tune now, where they can, they can move your voice up and down. If you, if you can't sing in time, they can move your voice over. They can move the music back. When they played on tape, they couldn't do that. They couldn't do that, really. So it was like, you had to be a musician to be, to do music. It was like, I mean, it was a guy, who was it? Who, who was it sang? Jesse's Girl. Sunday Springfield. Now, they were talking about him getting his break and the picking Jesse's Girl for it, for it to be his single. He went in, he could play guitar on that pretty well, but he went in and the producer's like, oh, we don't like how you play guitar. We're getting somebody else in to play guitar for you, so you had to get a session musician. You didn't get away with it, like, you have to sing in key, you have to sing in time, you have to, you have to be a musician to be able to play music when it was that, so it means you had to practice more. Nowadays, obviously, everything is just, because it's digitally done, you can make someone sing, you can make music sound well without a whole load of musicians. It's a, that's a, that, that's what makes it different, whereas on my side of it, I just thought, like, I want to be able to sound, record, sound live the way that I sound recorded, so to stay authentic um, with it. But with uh, with acting, I'd say that's the big difference between theatre and uh, film. I've worked with some film actors who says, man, I couldn't do theatre. No, I couldn't do that. Uh, I love theatre, and, that's, and I think the best actors sort of do come out of the theatre. I do because having that pressure where you're on stage, you're live and you need to perform a scene uh, with 400 people watching you, it's like that's that's like that that tests your character. Whereas in film, there's an old joke that goes about that says, "Look, a good director could make a bad actor look great, but a bad director could make a good actor look <laughs> pretty average." So there is a slight difference with that as well. I see it. Looking back at your life, the direction that things have gone in and, and all the sort of steps that got you to where, to where you are, do you ever think back and think, wow, I'm actually doing this? I'm actually like, I'm acting and I'm making music. Do you ever sort of just surprise yourself by, by realizing, huh, this is where I am now? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, well, it's funny because I was out for dinner with a pal of mine's, a friend, and he's from, he was up from London. And I think see, when, you get, when you're coming up to 30, when you become the, you start, I think you sort of go through a quarter life crisis where you start asking, what have I done with my life? What am I doing? Uh, have I done anything significant? And I was talking to him, and this is a guy that I went to the sports school with, and he says, man, you've done so much. And I, I sort of took it for granted because, see, when you're living it, I think you're always looking at the next thing. You're always looking about how do I get there? How do I get there? How do I get there? And I'm like, well, having the opportunity to become a, a professional actor, to become a musician, to tour foreign countries and uh, do theatre all over the world and be on Hollywood sets, the stuff guys would guys would kill for to like, for, to to do that sort of thing. So at times I do sit back and. I do definitely appreciate everything that I've done and I'm grateful for the opportunities that I've been given. But on the other side, there is a sort of selfish side of me that thinks, man, I want more. I want to do more. I want to do more. And I'm always hungry to do the next thing. It's like, I, I say it with, like, m- with music and when I'm writing a song or when I feel that there's a song coming, it's, it's almost like an itch that you're desperate to scratch. And once you've wrote that song and that thing is out, it's like, oh, that was it. That's what I needed. I needed that. I needed that sort of outlet to, to, to do something. So I do appreciate what I've done, and I'm grateful for it. 
But I always, I always try to focus on what I'm doing now and, and where I'm going. I do. Well, Michael, man, thank you so much for talking to me. It's been great diving into the acting world, the music world. Definitely look up uh, Michael Cook, doing all right, on Spotify and SoundCloud. You can follow him on Facebook under uh, Michael Cook Music. Instagram, it's Michael Cook Official. And, Michael, we'll talk soon. I'm just going to escape being here. Thank you. Hey, guys, what's going on? This is Brian Murphy from One Time Mountain, and you're listening to Citywide Blackout with Max Bowen. Rock on. Hey, everyone, Max Bowen here. If you're a longtime listener of the show, you know how much I love Comixology. This is the best place to go for digital comics from Every company out there, from the big two to independent creator-owned titles. Well, folks, the big news is that they are hitting the presses. In the spring of 2021, they'll be teaming up with Dark Horse Comics, publisher of titles such as Black Hammer, Hellboy, and Sin City, my personal favorite, to distribute print editions of Comixology Originals, graphic novels, and collections. This is going to include the Eisner Award winner, Afterlift, along with Breaklands, Youth, and The Black Ghost. I have read most of these titles. They are amazing. I cannot wait to add them to my bookshelf. Now, these will be available in comic shops, bookstores, and libraries. And more will be announced in the weeks and months to come. But if you want all the updates, go to ComicsologyOriginals.com and follow them on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. All right, folks, that brings the episode to a close. You can follow the show on Facebook under Citywide Blackout and Twitter and Instagram under Citywide Max. Listen to the show on Podbean, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, and every Saturday at 10 p.m. on Boston Free Radio. To close things out, here's a track from the new album, Losing My Mind for Nothing. As always, keep those ears open. It's making me